All right. Wow. Thank you. Good morning. Um, what I want to talk about, I mean, you're about to talk about Java essentially for two and a half days. Everybody's going to talk about code, is talk about databases, talking about frameworks, technologies. And I would like to take a small moment of your time to talk about something completely different, right? There is a reason that all of us are here in this room and we're not at work, we're not at home, right? And your phones are probably off uh, in spite of Twitter. The reason is here you can focus on getting the knowledge. You can focus on learning new things and you can focus on talking to your peers, right? You don't have any distractions here, or you shouldn't. So that's what I want to talk to you guys about is it's nice that we know about coding, we know about technologies, we know about everything. Now how do you get to the point where you and your teammates and maybe your whole company can sit down and actually write code. I don't know about you guys, um, I'm going to ask, so be prepared to wave your hands, is uh, do you guys feel that you have enough code? Who codes enough every day? Right, 12. Who gets distracted a lot during work? OK, you guys are alive. OK. I get distracted a lot. It's part of my role. I, you know, I don't code as much as part of my role anymore, um, but I see the guys struggle, and I came into a new company, and essentially what happened was developers were spending more time answering questions than they were writing code, and then they were being criticized for not writing code fast enough. So what's happening there? Stuff like that I want to talk about. First, a brief intro. I'm Kees Jan Koster. I'm married. I have two kids. I live in Delft. I ride motorcycle, that's how I get <laughs> that's how I get to work undistracted. I do Java. Um, I speak about Java a lot. And I like big systems. Millions, you know, I love that kind of stuff. And currently I work for a company called Visions Connected. I'm a contractor and they contracted me to help with their team, specifically to help their team perform better and to write more code. So much of what I'm telling you today is from what I do every day. We all know the distractions, right? You've got to go to meetings. You've got to answer questions. Stuff breaks in production, which leads to further questions. And generally, there is a feeling of being overwhelmed with the work, right? Oh, you're done? Oh, can you do this? Oh, can you do this too? And do you have time for that? And at some point, you and your teammates are just, you know, you're just juggling to get your time set up right. And then there's the personal thing of procrastination, of which I know everything. I mean, these slides, you can ask the other speakers, were finished this morning during breakfast, right? And actually, I'm not even going to talk about procrastination because I can fill two, three hours just with that topic. So that procrastination part is all on you, OK? You have to fix that all by yourself. All right. so. There are lots of solutions out there. Everybody says they have the silver bullet, and they can help you do distraction-free programming. So I'm going to pick a few out of those, a few that are used a lot, and I'm going to use those. That's not to say these are better or worse than other things. These are the ones I personally use the most. And maybe they help you. OK? So getting things done is the methodology that's about you. It's about how you personally organize your work. It's a very personal thing. It's not even for coders. I think it's very suitable for coders because it's a, it's a method. Right? It's very methodical, something that fits with how we think. Scrum, I don't think in this room I need to talk about Scrum. You guys know Prince2. Who here knows Prince2? OK, so I need to talk about that a lot. This is one of the bigger project management things. It's very popular in Holland, where I'm from. and. Um, it's essentially for projects bigger than a year or two years. That's when you start using this kind of methodology. Right? It, too, gives structure, in this case, to a whole company. And you can see the layering, personal, team, company level. Right? And then there's the human interaction protocol. Human interaction protocol is my personal favorite open source project. This is about how people interact. We'll use some of that. 
brief introduction of getting things done. Who here knows or does getting things done? Oh my God. All right, look it up, right? It, uh, yeah, Prince 2, don't worry about it, okay? Getting things done, yes, you'll want this. What it says is everything you have to do, everything, downright from taking out the trash to doing your booking, bookkeeping, doing your work, everything goes into one single inbox. That's the basic principle. Everything you have to do ultimately goes into one inbox. Not on your phone, not on your email, not one inbox. And from there, you just start churning through it. Okay? That's the idea of getting things done. I have to keep it really brief. Uh, we'll touch on it later a bit more. Scrum. This happens to be a picture. Who here knows Scrum? Okay. Good. I like it. You know, if you apply it well, it works. Sometimes it doesn't work. Um, try it at least. Sprints too. This is, you know, documents and there's lots of reporting, lots of management, lots of project leads are needed for this, right? But this will manage a project across an entire company across the globe. It's designed to organize projects into work packages, right? So you've got a two-year project and then you have three months work packages. And this is how it fits together. You can use Scrum for the work packages, right? So company level prints to, and then Scrum for your team, for your work package. For a couple of months, you work on a, on a prints to work package, and that essentially you do Scrum style, right? And then one level down. On a personal level, every day, you can use getting things done to get things done. I mean, what's in a name, right? This is, how these, this is why I chose these three for today. There's lots more, and I'm sure you guys have your favorite methodologies, so you're going to have to substitute those in your head. What I would like to talk about now, oh, by the way, uh, if you have any questions, I don't know, the room is pretty big, so you, know, you can interrupt and ask, okay? Oh, we have a microphone. Uh, there's no qu time for questions at the end, because I always run out of time, okay? So ask your questions in between. Uh, you can always find me after, too. So one of the things, I, I, I just got a new section to my team. I'm, uh, the operations guys are now part of my team as well. And uh, I said, oh, we'll have meeting this, we'll have meeting that. And immediately they said, well, we don't need any more meetings, right? We don't want to do more meetings. And now I'm stuck because, I mean, you have to talk sometimes, right? There's stuff that you have to do in meetings because that's what you do. You have to have a planning meeting in Scrum, right? You have to do your daily. You have to have design sessions. I mean, if you're not having meetings, how are you going to do it? So when you do meetings, think of the meetings that you have in your company. I was working for a large Swiss telecom operator. I won't mention any names. And their meetings were like this. Everybody would sit at the table with their laptops working, right? And one person would be talking to the, well, hair of other people because they were all looking down. And then he would say, so what do you think, John? And then John would look up and he would say, oh, I missed the question. Can you repeat it? I, you know, after attending two of those, I was like, why am I even going? You know, no one's listening. They're not recording it, so you can't look back. So how are your meeting structures? When you go into a meeting, do you know why you're there? What is expected of you? It's a very basic question. Do you ask, if you go into a meeting that's vague, do you go and go, guys, why am I here? Do I have to be here? Do you ask that question? If you don't ask that question, why don't you ask the question? Sorry, what? There is no defined answer to that. Well, there should be. Somebody organized the meeting with a purpose. <laughs> and that purpose, maybe I like talking to people. I, I don't know. You know, but you, you have to know. So when you set a meeting, because you can't change other people, right? You can only change yourself. When you decide to plan a meeting, why don't you define the outcome that you expect in the start? I mean, you can say, oh, we need to decide this, we'll put the meeting, and then you're done. Or you can take 10 more minutes and write in the invitation, okay, 
start with one of these sentences, right? If it's a, if it's a training meeting, if, if you go to J prime, you walk away with, and the guys told you, you will walk away with knowledge, right? You know why you're here. You're here to learn. That's crystal clear to everyone. Or if it's a decision-making meeting, somebody needs a decision, we will decide this, right? So I know what to prepare for. Or if it's a meeting when somebody comes to collect something, when somebody needs you for another reason, you can say, your contribution is. I've done this in a meeting, four guys. I told each of the guys in the invitation, this is what I need from you. And as soon as this has been achieved, the meeting is over. And if you achieve the decision after five minutes, you can spend the other hour doing other stuff. You don't have to continue the meeting. You're done. How can you ever stop a meeting if you have no purpose? You can just go on and on and on, like I do now. So define the outcome of the meeting the purpose of the meeting, the goal, define the point where the meeting is over before you schedule the meeting. And if you cannot contribute, if you feel that Keijan is going on about stuff that you don't care about, by all means, go grab a coffee, right? Get up and leave. You can be friendly about it. You can say, look, guys, if I don't feel I'm contributing. I think this is time for me to go. Or you can ask, say, hey, guys, look, I'm, what can I contribute? Is it OK if I leave? In many companies, that's not done, right? In fact, I was in a company where we agreed weird to me that somebody was leaving my meeting. Is that strange when you think, hey, I set a meeting, he can't contribute, and I still feel he should be there? For what? For my ego? Funny, huh? If you're not contributing, if you're not learning, if you're not bringing knowledge, if you're not part of the decision, thank and leave. If everybody leaves, the meeting is over. Okay? This is a hard thing to get used to, and it's really effective. Because it means, I mean, just last week I had a meeting. After 30 minutes, my action points were clear, and I'm off to do them, right? And I have most of them done by the end of the meeting. That's pretty cool action points, and done in the same time. Now, if, uh, not everybody's like, like me, but if, if you're like me, you know, I, I have very specific points in the day that I'm effective. Uh, this is a random but it's that works. Levels, uh, which for me correlate very strongly with energy levels during the day. And I've of time, right? This is when I need to do work, not meet, not talk to other people, not handle email. This is the time I write my code. Learnings. And then 11-ish, that goes down, I start doing emails again and chaotic work, right? After lunch, I get my after lunch dip, Compensate that with Coca-Cola, which doesn't help. It, all it does is give you a short peak, and then you go into the trough again. So afternoons are essentially shot. And then at home, the kids, you know, take them from school, feed them, et cetera, et cetera. And then when they're in bed, 10 o'clock, I get another productivity peak. So I'm done. I'm, I'm working again until midnight. That's my day, right? Yours is going to be different. It's, it's going to be different for each of you. But there is a pattern. If you look at your team, Probably you'll find most of you guys are effective in the mornings, right? So try to schedule meetings in the afternoon when you're less effective. You have your code in. You have a good feeling about yourself when you go to lunch. saying, all right, that's done. And then the rest of the afternoon, it's okay if it's not as productive, right? Because on the whole, the peak has already been used for something productive. Maybe for your team that's different, but talk about this. So, Talk about the team and say, look, guys, what is our, as a team, what is our productive time? When do we write code? And when do we shut the door and let no one in? You can talk to your project managers and say, look, don't distract us in the mornings. Distract us in the afternoons. After a few mishaps, they'll learn and they will do it. 
Because for them also, if they get a happy team, a team that's responsive, it's better than some guy who's trying to code, who's, who's grumbly because he's being distracted. So it's good for both of you. And Scrum also does that, right? It says you have a meeting every one to four weeks, depending how long your sprints are, right? No other meetings are needed because that is when you do your retrospective, your planning meeting, etc. They also have predefined slots, so you know what you can expect. You talk about progress once a day. You don't have to pro talk about progress more than once a day because you don't need to. Once a day is fine. And if you plan that time slot well, everybody can be really productive. You talk about it, everybody gets cracking, you go to lunch, and the afternoon is okay to be less effective. And when you come out of a meeting, and I really hate product management for this, I get a stack of action points, not in my bug tracker, not in my getting things done inbox. I get an Excel sheet that's somewhere on a share, on a window share, no less. Look at me working with my Mac. Um, and I have to use this special computer that it gave me with that Windows thing on it to access the other action point list that I don't know which version it has because it's still open on her desktop and, you know, has she saved yet or not? Action points from meetings for developers go into the ticket tracker, right? You've got a bug tracker. If it's not in there, you don't have to do it. It's that simple. That's what I do with my teams. If there's work in email, if there's work in Excel sheets, that's all fine. It's, if it's not in the bug tracker, it doesn't happen. Oh, but it has to happen. Well, put it in the bug tracker. It's not hard. Don't allow your environment to give you action points from meetings that are not in the bug tracker. If you have to, you can put them there yourself, right? Just to keep track of them. And then you can give the reference to the person giving you the, um, the action points. And this is straight from getting things done. Scrum also says it, right? You have to have one backlog. Everybody has to work from it. But this is getting things done at its finest. You, as a person, can handle exactly one inbox, right? That's where you prioritize all your work. In fact, I go so far, not everybody does that, to have my personal life, my work life, everything is in one inbox. I don't have two inbox. I can't deal with that. So take out the trash is right up there with white new database cache interface. You put everything, all that stuff in one place, and then suddenly you don't have to worry about, oh, wait, there's this meeting. Oh, wait, I need to look at that Excel file that I don't know what version it is. Right? Oh, wait, there are four now? Whoa, what happened? Right? So to deal with meetings, define the outcome in the start. Right? If you don't know when you enter a meeting what the purpose is or what your role is, you can ask. It's an okay question to ask. Maybe you're not used to asking, but what, is my, what am I doing here? Right? How do I know that the meeting is over for me, that I can leave? If you ask it like that, maybe that's a, a bit crude, but I'm sure you guys, uh, from working with Bulgarians in the past, you guys are probably better at formulating this than the Dutch guys. So, but know your purpose. Do leave, right? Don't sit there, stare at the ceiling, because you're actually distracting other people. Check out with your team what your slots are. When is OK for meetings? What we do is we plan in the week all meetings on Tuesday. Our Tuesdays are shot. That means we have four days that, that we don't have meetings, which is pretty damn good. And put all the action points in the ticket tracker. OK? Any questions about meetings? This is a meeting too, obviously. Think about that. I won't give you an action point, so don't worry. All right, let's go to questions. So I come into this team at Visions Connected, and I'm amazed. I mean, I'm used to development answering questions, yeah? But in a 70-people company, there are three guys in development. And all day, every day, there's somebody at their desks. How exactly are you coding when somebody is talking to you and you need to face them, right? 
I know some women, that secretaries, I, that can write an, a letter while they're talking to me, which is really disconcerting, but they can do it. But guys, I'm sorry guys, you can't do this. Yeah? It takes a special kind of training. So questions are distracting. What can you do as a person, as a team, as a company to deal with questions? Well, one thing you know, especially if you come into a company, there's people at the desk all day, every day, you can anticipate questions, right? You cannot plan to code because you know you'll be answering questions anyway. And it's a bit nasty to go to your project manager and say, look, I'm not actually writing any code because the past two weeks all I've done is answer questions, so I don't know what you have in store for me, but it ain't happening. That might trigger that person and say, hey, wait, maybe there's something wrong. Maybe not. But you know when the questions are coming. Why is a question such a problem? Specifically for knowledge workers. We're knowledge workers, right? We work in our heads. I'm talking to you now, but everybody's parsing the picture. So you've got the model. What you're doing is you're building a mental model of the code that you're working with. And if it's familiar code, that's easy. If it's new code, that's hard. And then you're building a mental model of the bug or feature that you're working on, right? What exactly is happening over time in data, on the machine, on the various machines that are part of this, in the user? What is he or she thinking, right? So you've got these very precarious models in your head that resemble your code, the problem, the user, and the expectation. And this is a house of cards, you know, and this dude with a jug of tea, comes and walks up to you, he's like, hey, about that email, right? And then, boom, there goes your house of cards. It's really annoying. I do it. I'm, I'm now the guy with the mug, yeah? I'm no longer coding, so that makes me the guy with the mug. And I know, I look at them, and I'm, he's busy. I'm like, oh, I need that answer. And I can see the house of cards blow away in the wind as soon as I ask. And taking that stack of cards and putting that house of cards back together again after the question costs time, costs half an hour, costs an hour, sometimes a day. And that, with eight questions, I can screw your day and you have no code done at all. And you'll wonder what happened. Because there were only eight questions. And lunch, and Twitter. Oh, my wife is SMS me, and, and, and Facebook. Oh, wait, and. There goes your house of cards. So you, knew, you need to anticipate, limit the input channels. Anticipation is easy, right? This is Sprint 2. If you look, apart from the spelling errors, it says report, 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 report. That may, for each and every red circle, someone with a mug is coming up to you and saying, oh, about that email. But this is Sprint 2. This is a you know, waterfall at its best you know the time and date that they have to report, which means two hours before that, they will come to you to ask. It's not magic, right? These guys don't by random accident come to ask for a report. They have to write their reports. It's okay to ask, so what, when are you reporting? Oh, on Friday? Oh, so I need to plan for time for you on Thursday, right? Oh, you do it Friday morning? Okay, we'll do it Friday morning. You can anticipate when your project manager for PINS2 is coming along. You can anticipate the question because you know what reports they need to write. Oh, I need to know what the project manager needs to know? Yeah, well, you need to do their jobs. I mean, what else is new? Maybe you don't have to, have to write it, but you have to really, you have to put yourself in their shoes. Okay, so this is what you need to report. You need to write an exception report. I'll tell you what, this is the list of JIRA tickets that I worked on that I think are exceptions. Oh, oh, I'm done. Thank you. You know, short meeting. Here's the list. I need to prepare, but I can do it in the stand-up. Hey, guys, there's going to be an exception report this weekend. What should we put in there? Oh, this? Okay, thank you. Pass it over to the project manager. Maybe, if you anticipate well enough, they won't actually come to your desk. They'll go, oh, wait, the email's already. Oh, wait, send a report. And they're done, gives them a good feeling, you're not interrupted because you anticipated, you chose when to communicate rather than wait 
for the interruption and then be upset that you're interrupted. And this is just an example, but you have to look at your team. You have to look at yourselves. When are we distracted? Why are we distracted? Ask yourself that question. Distractions are predictable. Okay. I'm going to switch tack a bit. I'm going to give you a little bit of, how do you say that, personal activity training. Really small thing. I still have 30 minutes, I see, so it's going to be fine. This is a model that's called situational leadership. Your manager should be doing that. If you are a team lead, if you're getting into the role of team lead, this model is for you. You'll love it, right? In essence, what it says is when you come into a company, you come into the right. You know nothing. You don't know where the coffee machine is. You don't know where the bathroom is. You don't know when you're supposed to check in. You don't know about the bug tracker, right? You know nothing. So people need to sit down with you and tell you, this is where the coffee machine is, there's the bathroom, at this time we're having lunch, etc. right? So you're being treated as a child. You're being told what to do. And you like it, right? Because that's at that point in time, you need that. And then as you grow, you know, you know the code base, you start to get no more, and you can start taking bugs on by yourself. And then people need to talk to you about how the vision of the project is. What's the purpose? Right? You're not being told line by line what to do, but people take a step back and they let you struggle and deal with the things that you learn. That's when you both go into the selling part. Right? You as a developer and your team lead as a manager. And then you're going to participate. In, at some point, you know, you can do the bugs. You, you know the bugs. When somebody says something, you oh, oh, okay, wait, ah, uh, this is it. And you fix it. Right? Right up to the point where, and this is where delegating starts to happen, where people tell you, look, I need this extension to the system, and it needs to do this and this. Right? You get two PowerPoint slides, and that's it. That's your whole spec. Good luck. Right? And you build it, and they're happy. So you, that's your journey that you do through the company and that your manager has to do with you. As a team lead, if you are a team lead, if you want that role, you need to be able to look at a person in your team and say, all right, he is in uh, M1, so I need to tell him what to do. That person is M4. He's much more mature, so we cooperate. Right? I tell him which direction we need to go and where he needs to find his information and get out of his way. So as a person for a task, you have a set place where you are. As a team lead, as a manager, you need to adapt to the person at the other side of the table. Okay, why am I telling you this? Well, I told you about anticipating report. If you are in M2, M1, as a team or as a person, this is when you are surprised by reports. Right? Oh, I need to update you on this. Well, this is the answer. Right? Oh, I'm doing some, oh, 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 yeah, yeah, this is the answer, right? If you go into M3, if you're more mature, you say, look, I know this afternoon you're coming in for a report, so we'll sit down over lunch together and I'll give you the report, right? That's when you start anticipating. That's when you start communicating and people start receiving your reports because you know they need it or because you noticed they need it, yeah? So if you see yourself more in a software craftsmanship relation, if you really want to grow in a company and you want to be on the right side where people trust you with large chunks of functionality, large chunks of code, you need to be the one sitting on the other seat saying, okay, so this is what you need to report, so I give you this so you can make that out of it. That's the mental step that you have to be careful of doing. Okay? All right. Limit input channels. Um, who's got his phone switched off for the day? One, two, three. That's actually quite good. Usually no one has their phone switched off. So, great. What you're doing is you're limiting the number of channels available to reach you by the, your, the world around you, and that gives you fewer distractions. It's that simple, right? For those who don't have their phone enabled yet, there's this little tick on the side, right? It's right here. Uh, there you go. 
it's off in my case. Limit the number of channels. If you look at my phone, I have all the settings for all the apps to not put things on the screen, except when it's about calls or if there's an incident. Facebook, Twitter, they don't get access to the front page of my phone. My wife does, right? If she calls during work hours, something's up, right? That's part of my relationships. I know uh, other, uh, my relationship, other relationships may be different. Facebook, Twitter, even email, they don't need my front page of my phone. They don't need direct attention. So they have no access to the notification center. I just switch it off. Games, games, why are games playing sounds on my phone when they're in sleep mode? No way, that doesn't happen. Think for yourself, the distraction, the thing that comes in, that pop-up, what does it mean, right? And this is very confusing to many people. There are two terms, urgency and importance. And very, very few, and I make the mistake even today, very, very few people can distinguish between urgent and important, right? Urgent is emails on my phone, on the first front page. You know, I open my phone, the first thing is, oh, you've got 12 emails, whoa, 12 emails, right? Ringing sounds, there's games, oh, you've got a new level, oh, shit, I've had a new level, right? That's urgent. But is it important? Is it important that heyday, you know, that my smelter finished in heyday? Is that important? How many people die because of this? So it's very urgent, but it's not important, right? That makes it Q3. Games are Q3. They're a distraction. Urgency is important. It, 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 is, it is a precious good. You as a person have only a limited bandwidth for urgent things. Until you get that, whoa, I don't know what happens feeling. So limit the number of things that are allowed to be urgent to you, and you get less distraction. Production incidents are urgent and important. System is going down now. OK, urgent, important, clear. What I do, everything that's in Q3, that's urgent but unimportant, I push into Q4. It's not urgent, uh, so it doesn't get access on my phone to more than maybe a batch, maybe not even. Right? Certainly no sounds. That makes it Q4. I start to learn to ignore it. And after a while, you literally don't care anymore whether your smelt are finished or not on heyday. Same thing, if people come to my desk, it better be urgent, right? If I'm busy and people interrupt me for non-urgent thing, I say, look, sorry, you know, I love to answer the question, but you need to do, this is email stuff. Yes? Are you rude to them? Uh, I have been, the question is, am, am I rude to them? Uh, I'm Dutch, so it's very hard for me to determine if I'm rude or not, <laughs> you know? It, that's, uh, sorry, that's a cultural thing. <laughs> By definition, probably. What I do is I, I try not to be, I try to be, first I try to educate them. I say, look, this is certain urgency, right? Um, and we need to, next time, do this via email, right? And the second time, I'll be nice. But I have, I mean, there is a specific case where I was doing a test, and it was very important. Everybody was, oh, it's very important. Okay, so when I'm typing the email with the result of the test, I get interrupted, literally people walking up to me so many times, I couldn't send the email to the person interrupting me telling what the report was. So they were interrupting me to the point where I couldn't type a damn email. And yes, I did get rude at that point, and the lady was very upset, um, and I've never seen her again since. <laughs> she wasn't even in my department. You know, it was like literally random people for me coming up to me. I, I, that wasn't good for my name in the company, by the way. So yeah, sometimes there is a point, you know, everybody has their breaking points, uh, you'll be rude. Uh, try not to be. If you're not rude, if you educate people, if you explain why, they are more likely um, to react. What you've got to keep in mind, though, is that if what is unimportant and not urgent for you may be either important or urgent, or they confuse the two, 
for the other person. So somebody comes up to you and it's very urgent to them, but you've got, you know, he's the third today. So it's not urgent to you because it can't be because you're already working on two urgent things and it doesn't work like this. So be careful when you communicate with people to understand that their urgency and yours may be different and keep that in mind when you talk to them. This model really helps. Plot your work there. Ideally, this is what Stephen Covey says in The Seven Habits of a Highly Effective People, you work on Q2 things only, right? It's important, but it's not urgent. And this is hard because you'll be pushed to work on urgent things. We'll get to that later. Um, yeah, same here. As a team, you usually have a scrum master, right? Make sure that the scrum master does some form of filtering. That is the person who oversees your team and he or she knows what the priorities are for your team. And that person can filter some of that urgency. They can help with, that, with communicating that, okay? So make sure that the distraction come onto that one person. That also limits your input channels because you'll be physically separated. I've, as a scrum master, I've sat physically between me and my team. I've put whiteboards such that people had to pass by my desk in order to talk to the team, to be able to physically shield them. And in some organizations, that's what you have to do. We should get those poles with the ropes between them and uh, to direct people to the right place. Communicating availability is important. Rotating the hat. Think of that as, uh, oh wait. So communicating availability is important. Right? People need to know when they see a team of guys just hacking away, they think, oh, they're quiet. I can interrupt them. Right? They need to have some form of hint that says, hey, you're not available. You're not welcome to talk to us right? in the friendliest sense of the word. This is what the daily scrum meeting is for. I tell people, you are welcome to interrupt us every day, 10 o'clock in the morning. You can just come in, you can ask any question you like, there are no dumb questions, there's no question wrong at that point, right? Because this is the time of day, we as a team are talking what we're doing today, and your input is valued. I don't say literally, but I hint at, and you're not welcome the rest of the day, right? This is the time to interrupt us. This is the universal developer si signal saying, don't interrupt me, right? I've actually got a pair of these. They're really nice, but they're open. So you should get closed once. So you're literally closed off. The gaming uh, headphones are usually closed. Get those, right? So you actually don't hear what other people are saying. Saves you a ton of distraction. Especially, some people are more easily distracted than others. I've got one guy on a team who literally has the attention span of, an, of a net. So he's wearing these cans and he can focus much better. Um, okay. So, when you're answering questions, right, questions come to you for a reason. Have you ever sat down and wondered, why do people ask this question to me? Right? I've, I've had people go, oh, why are they? Oh, I've got 15 minutes left. Wait, which is the authoritative one, yeah? The oh, you're there, okay. Bashir. Uh. So, which, why are people coming to me with a question? And I don't mean the, uh, why are people coming to me? Because I mean, literally sit down and think, what are they missing so that they have to come to me with a question? What haven't I told them? What haven't I provided in the past that makes them come to me for that question? Um, again, I'll, I'll refer to this uh, leadership model, right? Um, what's interesting is that if as a manager, if as a team lead, you're very directive, the person that you're dealing with will automatically take a more passive stance, right? This is a, it's our lizard brain that does that, right? If people around you start steering you and saying, all right, this is what you should do, you automatically start depending on them to tell you what to do. 
except for the odd guy who will go against that. But by and large, groups of people will follow this model, right? So if I'm being directive, if I tell you what the solution is, you'll stop looking for it yourself. So I've got these two guys on my team. This was at the previous gig. And there are new guys coming in all the time. And there's this one guy who essentially knows everything. I don't know if you guys have that on a team, but he's essentially the king of the platform. And he knows everything, so everybody goes to him for answers. But he's frustrated because, yeah, I know everything, but I want to do different things. I want to work on new stuff, right? I want to get out of this old code that by now I've seen so many times. I'm sick of it. I want to do new things, new architecture, new, new, new. But I can't because everybody is just sort of dragging me back into the old code. This is literally what happened. But yeah, I mean, the new guys are coming in, and you can't just plop them into the code and say, oh, good luck. You know, fix it. It doesn't work like that. You know? It is like that, yeah. I mean, people, you saying it's usually like that. It happens. And I've got to say, one of the things I do when new guys come onto the team, I say, I do throw You know, when you come in. We'll give you all the help. If you see this in your team, if you see this happening, you know, the, the king of the hill being frustrated, wanting to move on, he's essentially forced to stay in this answering question roles. And somewhere it's good. You know, I, I like answering questions. It feels good to help someone. Someone comes to you with a question, you answer it, you're both happy, right? You because you helped someone, that person because he can move on. But you've got to move on. You've got to be rude to stay in the theme, right? Now, that person coming to you with a question, he needs support, but he doesn't need the answer. He thinks he's asking for an answer, but as soon as you stop giving the answer, you're essentially forcing, you're inviting to him or her to be more inquisitive, to look more, to look further. And literally, in this case, what we did the guy in green was told, you can answer any question people have, but you, you are allowed to provide only the class name in which the problem is. Not the line, not the problem. You are allowed to say, class this and this will give you the answer. And that is the effect for the other guy. I said, well, you know, I can go to him for the answer, but he's going to say the class name anyway. I might as well find the class myself. Right? And the guys new on the team started learning quicker, and the guys old on the team weren't stuck in answering questions as, as much. All right. Now, if your team is doing production support, like my teams are usually, you have some level of production incidents, questions, sales questions that are coming in. You can't work in isolation. So what we do in a small team even is we have a role, a hat, a uh, point man we call it, um, you know, a priority checkout, priority boarding lane, I don't care what you call it, but make clear to the world which person of the team is okay to interrupt. In fact, in the team I'm in now, that person for the two weeks of the sprint doesn't get any tasks. Their work is only to deal with interruptions of the team. Yeah? And they're not allowed to answer questions. They can update the documentation and then point the question asker to the documentation. That is how you answer questions. And that's also how you manage questions. You teach the world around you instead of keeping them in that dependent state on you. Right? So now we have this big sign that says point man, and that's where you walk to, and the other guys can code. And what's interesting is one of the other guys told me, he said, now that I know that that person is responsible, I also feel less responsible because I know it's being handled. He feels responsible for the platform if there is a problem. 
right? And he feels re responsible for every problem. But now, since there is a clear person dealing with interruptions, he can let go, right? And he can focus on the code without worrying that something will be missed because it's been taken care of. Who here has a team where they do this? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Who here has interruptions as a team? Okay, I was a bit worried out there. Okay, for the guys who raised their hands but didn't raise it earlier, think about this model. It's really effective. And it's a way of not having to be rude to people because you can say, yes, of course, your question is welcome, as long as you put them on this person. Okay, I'm probably running wildly out of time, but I'm going to continue on until someone drags me off the stage. So, this picture is a picture I recently used in the company. We have four lines of support. First line, second line, sysadmin, then development. Why in the company that I'm in, everybody goes to development for questions? I mean, literally, when there's a problem with one of the demo rooms, people will walk past support, first and second line, past sysadmin, to development and ask, why is it offline? I'm coding. You know, how, how am I supposed to know? I'm in a customer demo. Yeah, I'm in a coding session. Really strange conversations. What I observed is, think of the, the black lines as all the possible problems there could be, right, technologically speaking. And then if you have first-line support, there's this, there's this section of that that you can handle as a person, right? You know enough to solve for the customer, and he's happy or she's happy, and you're happy because you help someone. And sometimes that problem is out of your box. You can't solve that, so you pass it on to second line, and they can solve more problems. And if that doesn't work, you pass it on to sysadmin, and they can pass, solve even more problems. But yet they get stuck, and then... It goes into development, finally. By that time, four people are working on it, right? It's already a hugely expensive problem. Okay, keep that in mind. Now, when I look at first line, second line, sysadmin and development, I see this, right? The potential of the boxes is the gray one, but they only have the skills and knowledge for the green stuff. What does that mean? To me, that means that if I start training first-line support, they can do stuff, they can do everything that second-line support now does, which frees up time on second-line support to learn more and learn more problems to solve, right? Five minutes. Oh, no. Five minutes. So I would like to see this, right? I'd like to see first-line support solve all the problems that they can solve, but they're not doing it today. In fact, when I talk to them, I say, look, this is this kind of problem. You know, honestly, I think you should be able to solve it. And they say, yeah, I think so too. And it, you laugh, and it's a, yeah, it's a bad joke, essentially. I mean, so why aren't you? Well, I don't know. I don't know how to solve it. I don't know how to analyze the problem. They literally say that. So there is a training opportunity here. They don't have the information, they don't have the training, they don't know how to analyze a problem and ultimately to solve the problem. Now, I'm all the way at the bottom, right, I'm, uh, with my team. I can't go and train first-line support. That's out of my realm. So what I did, I talked to the guys and said, when you answer a question, you don't answer the question anymore, right? People come here because they know you'll answer the question. So you need to stop doing that. And they'll stop coming to you. It's that simple. But you can't be rude. So you don't answer, you teach. You're only allowed to teach sysadmin, second and first line support, how things work. If you answer the question, you help one person out of the 20 that work in first and second line support. If you teach the team to solve that problem, 20 people will know. And it'll be the last time you ever talk about that. How cool is that? How do you do that? Right? How do you teach people ad hoc based on questions? Well, first off, we have that point man. We have the priority checkout. So that person has a specific goal only to answer on the wiki. 
right? We use Confluence. I'm sure you guys do, use similar stuff. Put the answer on Confluence as an FAQ item. Look up the documentation. We just switched all the documentation over from Word to, to Confluence. Look at the documentation together with the question asker and say, all right, why is this section not clear? And then you edit the section. Note, you edit the section together to make it more clear. And the conversation you have, you learn which part of that gray box up there you can fill in. And you fill that in with documentation. And then you send an email to all of support saying, hey, this section of the admin manual has been updated. Kindly look at it. And you got an email back from one or two people saying, hey, thanks. Because they, you, what you're doing is you're no longer keeping them dependent on you. You are empowering them to do more work, more difficult work, more interesting work. Their work goes from translating whatever it is that the customer says to a question to development and back to analyzing problems, which is what they wanted to do, which is what they're hired to do. Yeah? So don't answer the question. Answer in documentation. If you're in development in sysadmin, even second line of support, you're training the person who comes to you. Likewise, if you're sysadmin, if you're development, if these are technical things, like this is, for example, yesterday we had an outage because a, a machine, a clock had drifted for a few minutes. In 2016, clocks drift. Everybody knows this, and it's a solved problem because we all have NTP. So not only as development, we should stop setting clocks, right? Because that's the sysadmin task. Not only should we say, hey, you need to change this clock. We need to educate sysadmin saying, look, guys, all clocks need to be in sync because otherwise the platform won't work. And sysadmin needs to take the step and say, all right, I'll automate that because it's boring. Yeah? So you, do, you need to stop answering questions. But it takes time. You know, I'm, I'm sitting there with head of support, and he's, uh, you know, his hair is on fire. Oh, blah, 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 blah. I know, I know. It's urgent for you. It's not urgent for me. You know, have that conversation. And I say, look, by now, you sitting me here means that first line, second line, sysadmin has already worked on it. There's three people plus you plus me. That's two managers, three people. Is it okay if I spend 30 minutes writing documentation and solving this problem for good? Or do you want to have the same five people doing the same conversation next week, which will take another eight hours across the five of us? Which is more effective on a company level? And I know, I mean, that is my way of being rude because I know at that point in time, he doesn't have the mental bandwidth to deal with that because there's a customer almost physically sitting on him to get that done. Oh, one minute. No pressure, no pressure. Okay, right? So you need to say this as friendly as possible, but this is the bottom line. By the time it gets to you as development, it already costs man hours. So you can take 20 minutes to write documentation, and it's actually cheaper than solving the problem. Okay? All right. So... Generally being overwhelmed. I'm feeling like, oh, I can't deal with this. I can't deal with this. Probably by now, most of it you've heard, right? Work towards one to-do list. I was an uh, employee for a long time. Now I'm a freelancer. One thing about freelancing, for all the good and the bad parts, is ultimately I only have one and only one boss. There's one guy who pays my bills. And no matter what anybody says, he pays my bill so I can always go to him and say, out of these four things, which one do I do first and which three don't I do? And that person will have an answer because he pays my bills. In companies, usually you have you know, your line manager and then you've got your project leads and you probably have four project leads and this gets really confusing. So limit the number of inboxes, limit the number of channels, limit the number of inputs that you have and limit the number of people that control you. And it saves a huge bunch. This is where a scrum master comes in. He or she needs to stand for the team, deal with the interruptions, and then have your team be the one person for your team for priorities. For the scrum master, it is the product owner. right? For the product owner, it's the product managers and the project managers, etc., etc. 
you are not the only one who feels overwhelmed, right? If you're going crazy, the others are. If they're not looking crazy on the outside like you are, that means they're dealing with it in a different way, but that doesn't mean they don't feel it. Some people are very good at ignoring that they're overwhelmed and just whoop, go into screw you mode and just go and work on one thing. But you're not alone, right? You're in a team. You're in a team for a reason. You're in a team so you can help each other talk about this. Say, look, I'm overwhelmed. What as a team are we going to do about this? It starts with you, right? You're the one with the problem, so you better solve it. And you better start working on the solution. Try to focus on a ticket tracker. Again, limit the number of channels that you have. In so several teams, I've said to the world, look, guys, I see work coming in through lots of mediums. If it's not in JIRA, it doesn't happen. Any questions? And then people come to me, oh, but it's important. Well, put it in the damn tricking tracker. It's not hard. It's there. You know, on a company level, we agreed we would do that. So why are you sending email? But it doesn't work. Well, of course it doesn't work, but you need to start fixing that. Because the ticket tracker doesn't work, there's no reason for you not to work on it. Okay? It's not to introduce a new system. Ticket tracker, ticket tracker, ticket tracker, all day long. Keep it clean, and you'll notice it start working for you instead of being just one of the many. And finally, you need to do one thing and do it well. Right? Focus on things, make them your development. Right? You're not the quick guys. You're making new stuff. The quality that you deliver determines how much shit comes out of it later. Right? So take a little bit of extra time to make sure that doesn't happen. Because it will come back to you, and it will bite you. I'll skip this part in the interest of time, but if you haven't already, look at Getting Things Done. It's a really good book. I love the methodology, and there's lots of information on it. All right. And that's it for the distractions. And I hope that you find time to code. Thank you. <laughs> Any final questions before I get dragged off the stage? Oh, OK. I'm not even allowed to do questions. Find me in the lobby if you like to have uh, an answer to your questions. Thank you.